women who played an important role in the everyday life of their houses and communities in Viking society were treated with blood-curdling screams, but women who dared to challenge social norms were subject to terrible punishments that had a devastating effect on both their souls and bodies. Let's find out. Were Viking punishments a means of maintaining order or a reflection of a brutal and oppressive culture? Women in general in the Vikings were expected to fulfill traditional gender roles, such as managing the household and taking care of the children. The extent to which females were required to fulfill these responsibilities varied based on circumstances such as social standing and location. Household tasks, the production of textiles, and even some trading were all activities that fell under the purview of women. Those who disobeyed the law were subjected to public humiliation and ostracism through the use of rituals known as shaming. The purpose of these rituals was to demonstrate how socially unacceptable their behavior was and to dissuade others from behaving in a manner that was comparable to what they had done. In shame rituals, participants may engage in a range of practices, including verbal criticism, ridicule, or even public humiliation. Another one is flogging. In Viking civilizations, it was common practice that individuals could be punished with corporal punishments, like flogging or whipping. The harshness of the punishment may differ from case to case and be influenced by factors such as the nature of the crime, the view of the ruling authorities, and the opinion of the community. The practice of flogging or whipping was likely carried out in front of an audience, both as a sort of entertainment and a deterrent. By publicly shaming and torturing the culprit, the purpose was to mete out punishment to the guilty as well as discourage other people from committing crimes of a similar nature. The next form of punishment is combat in the fire. People who were suspected of dealing or doing other crimes were subjected to a unique form of trial known as the ordeal by blaze. The purpose of this type of trial was to determine whether the accused person was guilty or innocent of the allegations. In this specific investigation, the accused person was subjected to a test that involved fire. The accused person would be subjected to an ordeal by blaze in which they would be made to walk barefoot over hot coals or hold a flaming iron. After the ordeal, it was believed to be evidence of guilt if the hands or feet of the person revealed major burns or wounds as a result of the ordeal. On the other hand, it was regarded as a sign of innocence, meaning that the gods had intervened on their behalf. If the person's hands or feet were undamaged or recovered quickly after being injured, the belief that the gods would protect the blameless while allowing the guilty to pay for their misdeeds was the foundation on which this suffering was built. Do you know there were other superstitions like this too, such as an ordeal by water? Coming in at our next form of punishment is fines. Fines, also known as vergild, were an integral part of Viking law and played an important role in the resolution of disputes and the maintenance of social order. Vergild was practiced with the intention of making apologies to the victim or the victim's family for the harm that had been done. The amount of the Vergild was determined based on the number of factors, including the gravity of the offense as well as the social status of those involved. There was a numerical value called the Guild value that was assigned to each transgression. This value varied depending on the nature of the offense, the social position of the victim, and the perpetrator of the offense. The Vergild was typically compensated in the form of animals, goods, or precious gold, all of which reflected the offender's level of wealth and financial means. The purpose of the fine was to correct the injustice, make amends to the victim, and deter others from engaging in illegal behavior by providing financial compensation. If the offender is unable to pay the whole amount of the warrant, an arrangement can be made for partial payments or payment plans that are broken up into installments. In other instances, the offender's family members or neighbors might band together to assist in the process of raising the required funds. If you fail to pay the Vergild, there is the possibility that there could be a negative impact on your reputation or that you will be denied access to particular privileges within the community. The most brutal punishment in that era was the Blood Eagle. According to this picture, as you can see, the Blood Eagle was a particularly gruesome method of execution in which the victim's back was ripped open and their ribs were separated from their spine in the shape of an eagle's wings. The person was then hung upside down until they died. 
The purpose of this kind of punishment was to make the victim's life as miserable and painful as possible. Even if there are historians who believe the blood eagle was more of a literary construct or metaphor than an actual practice, there are other scholars who challenge the historicity and truth of these stories. The next one on the list is outlawry. The culprit was given the designation of an outlaw, which meant that they were no longer under the protection of the law and were shunned by the community. This constituted a form of exclusion from social life. When a person was given the designation of outlaw, it meant that they were no longer subject to the legal authority of the community. They were forced to face several societal consequences, including the loss of their rights. People generally viewed lawbreakers as a threat to society and a factor that undermined the neighborhood's efforts to maintain peace and harmony. Following the individual's proclamation as a criminal, they were effectively barred from returning to their previous community. They were forced to leave their homes and either live in isolation or look for new ones. They were effectively cut off from their various networks of support and abandoned to fend for themselves. Outlaws were considered fair game, which meant that anybody might damage or kill them without incurring any legal ramifications. This was one of the most crucial qualities of outlawry because it meant that anyone could hurt or kill them. As a result of the fact that they were no longer protected by the law, outlaws were vulnerable to acts of violence and vengeance from other people. Their status as fair game acted as both a form of punishment and a deterrent to those who might have been tempted to conduct actions of a similar nature because it served as a warning to those individuals. What do you think the reason is that women never speak their minds? Women in Viking societies played a subservient role within the family, and a significant portion of their social standing was determined by the relationships they had with men, such as their fathers, spouses, or sons. This meant that women were often treated as property by their male relatives. Because of this imbalance of power, it may be more difficult for women to secure protection from violence or justice in certain situations. Because of the patriarchal structure of Viking society, men were placed in positions of authority, and the norms and expectations of the time made it impossible for women to resist violent situations or to flee them. Also, it is not uncommon for women who have been the victims of assault to have a limited number of legal alternatives accessible to them, which can make it difficult for them to speak up for themselves. The primary functions of the legal system in Viking societies were first and foremost the upkeep of social order, and second, the resolution of conflicts that arose between individuals or groups. Even if there may have been processes for dealing with crimes like assault or homicide, the ability of women to access justice and find safety within this system would presumably have been determined by their social position and support networks. This was the case despite the fact that there may have been systems for dealing with such crimes. It's possible that the tight-knit communities and strong emphasis on kinship, ties that were common in Viking societies, made things even more challenging for women who had been the victims of abuse. Women may be hesitant to come forward or seek help out of fear of additional punishments or stigma if they believe that reporting abuse will alter the dynamics of society and family relationships. These stories serve as a reminder of the immense difficulties that they surmounted and their persistence. Their experiences shed light on the suffocating weight of societal expectations, the cost of solitude, and the subtle wounds that are left behind when violence is committed. They stand as a monument to the grit and fortitude of individuals who made it through a society in which there were no restrictions on the application of punishment. In terms of the punishments they received, what are your thoughts on how Viking women were treated? Share your views in the comments below.